Good morning. It's so good to be together this morning. I uh, enjoyed yesterday with you immensely. Uh, in fact, I was so happy about our experience that I even had difficulty sleeping last night. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's just been very, very special. Um, it was uh, suggested that I might describe what my suit is about. Um, you might be aware that when India became independent uh, of British colonial rule, uh, Nehru was the first prime minister, and he would wear a suit like this. So in East Africa, this was always called a Nehru suit. And so when Tanzania became independent, the president of Tanzania, the first president, Julius Nyerere, who grew up in the same community I grew up in, um, he wore a suit like this. In East Africa, they always called it Nyerere's Nehru suit. And I thought, I would like to have a suit like that sometime. Uh, I had a great admiration for President Julius Nyerere, as well as for Prime Minister Nehru of India. And I thought, to have a suit like these men wear, I would really like that sometime. Well, just a year ago, I was in New Delhi uh, doing a seminar there. And uh, my host, uh, during a break in the session, said, come with me. So we got in the car, went downtown, couple miles, and he took me to a tailor's shop. And he said to the tailor, make this man an Indian suit, an Indian national suit. And so I came back the next day, and he had this suit for me, and I like it. And so I will wear my Nehru suit today, if that is okay with you. Vitali said I may, and I'm very happy to wear this, yes. It is delightful, isn't it? Um, Let's just pause for prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you for your love for us, for a good night's rest, and for the joy of being together again this morning, today. We invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. For Lord, we need your revelation and guidance as we talk about matters which are very close to your heart, related to uh, our journey as followers of Jesus with our Muslim friends. So we invite your presence to be with us. May keep our speech kind and true and uh, give us your wisdom as we share together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I'm delighted that the dialogue has now arrived as well. So both books that we're using as text for this class are with us now. The, uh, the, the, um, both, both books are now with us. And, and I encourage you to keep reading them as we go along. Uh, yesterday, we gave assignments from this book as well as this book, although you didn't have this book at that point. Now you have it. And so for this morning, we're looking now at topic five called Muslim Theology and Praxis. And you will notice that the background reading for this chapter comes from this dialogue, chapter nine and chapter 10. Chapter 9 and Chapter 10. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who are taking the course for upper-level credit, graduate credit, um, seminary-level credit, then um, in addition to the essays that you will write from each chapter in this book, you will also write um, an essay on this book as well. And for each of the two chapters, every time we give an assignment, there's two chapters, which are comparative chapters on the Muslim side and the Christian side. You will write a two-page essay describing areas of convergence and divergence in the Muslim and Christian belief systems. You understand? For example, the first comparison, chapter one, is God in Islam, and chapter 13, God in the Christian faith. Those are the first two chapters. They're parallel chapters. God, God. The Islamic understanding of God, Christian understanding of God. So you would write a two-page um, paper reflecting on areas in which our understandings of God converge and areas in which our understandings of God diverge. So every time an assignment is given, with these two chapters, that would be the essay that you write for the graduate students. For others, you will read the chapter 
uh, mark it, meditate on it, um, but the essays will come out of this, this book here. You understand? Now, this morning, um, I suppose at about um, 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, our Muslim friends arose from bed. And uh, many of them went actually to the mosque that, that early in the morning. When I lived in Kenya, right across from the mosque, about 5 o'clock when it was still very dark, I would hear uh, our Muslim friends arising and walking up the street and going to the mosque. And what are they going to the mosque for? And why are they getting out of bed? They're getting out of bed to have the first prayer for the day. That prayer is to be offered when you can tell a white thread from a black thread. So the time varies according to when the sun is coming up. In the wintertime, get up later. Summertime, if you're living here in Kursk, you would get up um, um, uh, much, much earlier. And when they, when they come to prayer, this is the prayer that they say. It is called the Fatiha, meaning the opening. It's the first chapter in the Quran. It's very brief, only seven, seven verses. As I read this prayer, consider, could you as a Christian pray this prayer? It's always sit, prayed in Arabic, of course. I will read it in English. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, praise be to Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds, most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment, you do we worship and your aid we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, those whose portion is not wrath and who do not go astray. Amen. That's their prayer. Can you as a Christian pray that prayer? Do you feel you cannot pray that prayer? It is very similar to some of the Psalms mm -hmm. of, the, um, of the scriptures. What would Muslim, Muslim would say if we, instead of Allah, will put Elohim and pray that prayer? Yeah, I don't think they would find that acceptable because uh, the, um, the, the, um, the name Allah is very important for the Muslims, partly because Islam developed in a polytheistic situation where there was many gods and many names for these gods. And so the insistence on this one name is an insistence that there is only one God. Um, so they use the, uh, the term Allah. And see, the prayer is always said in Arabic because it was revealed in the Arabic language. So if you become a Muslim, you must memorize the prayer in Arabic. It's, it's a required ritual prayer that they pray. Mm -hmm. But yeah, oftentimes when I meet with Muslims in a mosque, uh, we will be sitting in a circle, and before we begin the conversation, um, they will say, let us pray. And they will sit with their hands outstretched and pray this fatiha, asking God to show us the straight way as we talk together. And sometimes then, at the close of the evening, if I feel it is appropriate, I will say, may I as a Christian now pray in your presence a prayer that Jesus the Messiah taught us to pray. And Usually, they will say, yes, you may. Uh, I could remember one occasion where they did not accept that. But that's, usually they will say, yes, I may do that. And so I pray the Lord's Prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Muslims do not pray that prayer because addressing God as loving Heavenly Father is an understanding of God that they have not received. Um, God is... Lord, he is sovereign, and we are his slaves. And to talk father language in relationship to God is language that we learn, is, is, is our experience of God in Jesus Christ. Um, sometimes, uh, I will, when Muslims pray this prayer in a circle like that, I will hold up my hands and join them in the prayer. I do not join them in the ritual prayer facing Mecca, because I feel that some of the symbolism regarding bowing toward Mecca is, uh, is um, uh, not convergent with the gospel. Although some of my Christian friends disagree with me, and they will actually bow facing Mecca when they pray 
I, I personally don't, don't do that. I have some questions about that. Because the symbolism of bowing toward Mecca, I, I feel, takes us in directions which are different than the gospel. But occasionally, I will say to my Muslim friends, um, uh, yes, I join you in this prayer. Um, however, I also want to confess before you that uh, as Christians, we don't pray day by day, Lord, show us the straight way. For the straight way has been revealed. You see, right here in the Fatiha, this yearning, Lord, show us the straight way, show us the straight way. I'll say the straight way has been revealed. And um, we read about this here in John chapter 14, where one of the disciples of Jesus says, Jesus, show us the way. And Jesus answered, John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, you see. And so in Jesus, the straight way has been revealed. So rather than pray, Lord, show us the straight way, we pray, oh Lord, thank you that the straight way has been revealed. And what a joy to walk in that straight way. And today may we faithfully walk in that way. Who is Jesus himself? The way to know God is loving Heavenly Father. Now, Muslims don't pray this prayer only one time during the day. This prayer is recited 17 times every day. You see, you pray five times. We all know that. The Muslims have five times for prayer every day. Within each of those five times, there are several rakas, as they say. Each raka involves bowing with the face to the ground two times. So in those five times of prayer, they bow with their faces to the ground 34 times and repeat this prayer 17 times. The prayer is repeated within each raka, uh, and there are 17 rakas that they need to complete every day. Um, and they come in clusters. Uh, uh, the, the, the early morning prayer, a certain number of rakas. The midday prayer, a certain number of rakas. The late afternoon prayer, a certain, certain number of rakas. And the, um, the evening prayer. Each of the five times of prayer, there's a certain number of rakas which are required. Within each raka, bowing with face to the ground twice and repeating this prayer once within each raka. And there's 17 rakas that are required. This is required. It takes about an hour every day to do this, to wash your hands, go through the ablutions, and then have the prayers. It's an hour invested in prayer every day. And I ask a friend of mine, a dear Muslim friend, don't you find that wearisome? <laughs> an hour every day, repeating this same prayer 17 times every day. Oh, David, he says, to bow with my face to the ground and repeat this prayer, Lord, O oh Lord, praise be to Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds, most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment. You do we worship and your aid do we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of those in whom you have bestowed your grace, those whose portion is not wrath, who go not astray. To pray that prayer with my face to the ground is to show that I want to submit fully to the will of God and to his authority. And I feel washed in the laws of God. And I feel so clean as I'm being washed in the laws of God as I bow in prayer in that way. No, it's not a burden at all. It's a joy, a submitting to God according to his commands in this way. And so our Muslim friends are people who, um, who very faithfully practice, practice prayer. Now, of course, at another level, there are then the prayers of petition. And so you'll, if you go to a mosque and you observe them going through these ritual prayers which are required and always expressed in Arabic, after the prayers are finished, you will see them sitting um, in the mosque, different places in the mosque, with their hands open like this, eyes looking up to heaven, and these are prayers of petition then. Um, and that can be uttered in your own native tongue. You don't have to pray the prayers of petition in Arabic. And you'll say, Lord, I've gone through the ritual prayers today faithfully. I've been doing it all week, back all my life. And please, my wife is very, very sick. Uh, please observe the, the extremity we're in within our family. 
I just beseech you, touch her with healing. Please, Lord, I hope you've seen the prayers I've offered in faithfulness to you. Please, Lord, reward me by touching my wife with healing. So you bring those petitions to the Lord, and that can be expressed in your own tongue. You don't have to do that in the Arabic language. <clears throat> now that's a bit of introduction here for what we're looking at in, in this topic six, uh, Muslim theology and praxis. Um, and uh, I'd like to look at this as, um, as a house, which is as Islam describes it. Um, there, is, there is this house, which is called the house of Islam. Let's just imagine that that's the roof of this house. And uh, this house of Islam is supported by ten pillars. On the one side of the house are the pillars of belief. And the other side of the house are the pillars of duty. A total of ten pillars. I think even in high school when you studied world religions or whatever, um, most of us were taught about the five pillars of Islam. But actually there's ten pillars. When they talk about the five pillars, people are talking about the five pillars of praxis, of duty, of Islam. But in reality, as I say, there's ten pillars, five of belief and five of, um, of duty. So this morning, this first part, we're going to just explore these ten pillars, which are essential to understanding the theology and the praxis of Islam. First, let's look at the five pillars of belief, of theology, of iman, as they say. You must believe in God, and his name is Allah. You must believe in one God. That is the starting point. <laughs> That's the A and Z of Islam. Believing in one God only. Secondly, you must believe in the books of God. And there are several of them. The first book of God is the Suhuf, which is referred to as the scrolls. In English, it's the scrolls, the Suhuf. The Suhuf of the prophet Abraham. Now, where is this Suhuf of the prophet Abraham? Alas, it's lost. We don't know where it is. And so those books aren't around anymore. Secondly, the Taurat, or the Torah, of the prophet Moses. Thirdly, and what is the Torah of the prophet Moses? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, um, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the books of Moses. Thirdly, you must believe in the Zabur, or the Psalms, of the prophet David. And you must believe in the Injil, or the Gospel, of Jesus the Messiah. And finally, you must believe in the Quran, which means recitation. Quran. Thirdly, you must believe in the prophets of God, all the prophets of God. Muslims say that there's 24,000 prophets, that every people and every language have had prophets of God. Um, some Muslims would be so broad-minded as to say Buddha was a prophet of God, even though Buddha was essentially an atheist, that every religion, every culture has had prophets of God. Fourthly, this is the fourth pillar now, you must believe in angels. And finally, you must believe in the final judgment. I'd like for a moment to just try to dialogue, uh, to, 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 um, to, um, um, to um, do a drawing of these, um, to demonstrate the worldview within which these, um, these pillars reside. 
Uh, I was doing a dialogue several years ago in, in Germany with a Muslim theologian. Uh, it was a theological colloquium, and into the second day, I think, I put this diagram on the, on the board. I said, is this an accurate reflection of your worldview? She said, yes, exactly right. This is exactly right. You have it right. So this is what I did. The first pillar of duty uh, of belief is belief in God. You must believe in God. Now, in the Islamic worldview, God created Adam as the first Muslim prophet. And God sent Islam down to Adam. We'll talk more about that later on today. So Adam is the first Muslim prophet, and God sent Islam down to him. Now this Islam that God sent down to Adam is eternal and unchangeable. It is the eternal word of God inscribed on the mother of the book in the heavens. Eternal word of God, which is Islam. And so in due course, God sent a portion of this down through the prophet Abraham. And this is the suhuf. But as we said, it's lost. So we don't have it. Then in due course, God sent down the... Um, the Taurat through the prophet Moses. And this, of course, is, is the first part of, of the Bible. And then in due course, God sent down the Zabur through the prophet David. And then in the course of time, later on, God sends down the Injil. Injil means good news. It's the Arabic word for gospel. Gospel means good news. Injil means good news. So God sends down the good news, the gospel, through Jesus, the Messiah. Notice that Muslims refer to Jesus as Jesus, the Messiah. If you just say Jesus, they feel you are being disrespectful. He is Jesus, the Messiah, not just Jesus. Or the Quran often refers to him as Jesus, the son of Mary. Interestingly, never, never Jesus, the son of Joseph. Never. It's always Jesus, the son of, of Mary. Isa bin, bin Mariam, you see. So, um, uh, but in our interaction with Muslims, I always refer to Jesus as Jesus, the Messiah. Don't be disrespectful of Jesus by saying just Jesus. Muslims are not happy with that. He is Jesus, the Messiah, through whom the Injil came, this, uh, this gospel. And then finally is the Quran, which came through the prophet Muhammad. Now, these revelations came through the mediation of angels. So that's the next pillar of, of, of belief, you see. Notice in this diagram now, I have placed four of the five pillars of belief. You must believe in God. You must believe in the prophets of God. And here we have put several of the prophets of God through whom books of revelation have come. These prophets, through whom books of revelation have come, are referred to as the Rasul, meaning the apostles. They have a special function. They receive books of revelation. Not all prophets receive books of revelation, but these have Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus the Messiah, and Muhammad have all received books of revelation. So you need to believe in all the prophets. As I said, there's 24,000 of them. But these particular prophets have a special role in this, that they have received books of revelation. 
And how are these books of Revelation sent down to the prophets? Ah, it's through the mediation of angels. It's angels that bring them down. You see. That's why you must believe in angels <laughs> to be a Muslim. Because it's through angels that these revelations come to humankind, you see. So here we have four of the five pillars of, of belief. Now, there's a fifth pillar of belief, which is the final judgment. And I didn't know how to diagram that. But I have four of the five in this diagram here. Now, many Muslims will add a sixth pillar of belief, and that is predestination. God is sovereign, and uh, everything that he does, everything that happens, is determined by his sovereign will. He is in control of everything. And this is referred to as Qadr, the belief in determinism or predestination, the ultimate sovereignty and authority of God to determine every aspect of our lives is a theology which permeates much of modern-day Islam. Uh, Muslims, like Christians, struggle with the issues of human freedom and the sovereignty of God. And uh, especially in modern times, Islamic theology tends to come down on the side of the sovereignty of God. So it has become a sixth pillar of belief for many, many Muslims. Sixth pillar of belief. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Let me pause for response or questions. Yes. Muslims have to read all of this. The Muslims are required to read Injil, Tara, Zabur. Do they require to read them or just to believe that they exist? Who has, who has the, the Torah and the Zabur and the Injil? Where, where are these books to be found? They're, they're found in the Bible. That's right. They're found in the Bible. Um, so Muslims don't possess these scriptures unless someone gives them a Bible. And normally, they don't worry about that very much. Because what they say is that the Quran, the Quran uh, clarifies and summarizes all that is important in the former scriptures. So if you have this summarization and clarification, why do you need the former scriptures? And of course, in our dialogical engagement with Muslims, we say, look, if God has revealed these scriptures that you call the former <coughs> scriptures, and you never look at them, is that wise? Should you not get in touch with the former scriptures, you see? And we invite them to consider the witness of these former scriptures. Um, if you say the Quran summarizes and clarifies, you should know at least what the Quran is summarizing and clarifying. And so we invite them to come and to see what these former scriptures say. Yeah, but we say, if you must believe them, you better read what you must believe, you see. Uh, that's right. Do remember what we said yesterday is that the Quran does advise the Prophet Muhammad himself. If you have any questions, ask the Christians what their scriptures say, and that will be helpful. I like that verse. I remind Muslims of it many, many times. <laughs> it's an important, it's an important key. Yes. They don't accept Gospels and Christian Bibles, so they must believe that Injil is lost as well, because the Gospels we have in the Christian Bible are corrupted. Yeah, so it's not the same uh, Gospel uh, we have in in our Bible. So they they mean different Gospels or, or what? Well, yeah, you sound like a very devout Muslim. That many of them will say, yes, the Gospels are corrupted, and I want to look at that in a later topic. We come to that very shortly when we talk about the Quran and, um, and the approach to scriptures. Uh, we want to address that. That is true, that many Muslims say the Gospels are corrupted, or we don't have the Gospel. One reason they say that we don't have the Gospel is because when they open up the New Testament, if someone gives them a New Testament, they read Matthew and then Mark and Luke and John. They say, where's the Gospel of Jesus the Messiah? And so there's a very common notion 
that Jesus brought the gospel, which is a book. Their idea is the gospel is a book. He brought the book, people rejected to believe the book, and so when he ascended to heaven, he took it with him to heaven. And so it's back up there with the mother of the book. It's not even on earth anymore because Jesus took it away with him because people would not believe it. Because there's confusion, why do you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Um, that's the question they have. Yeah. Yes? And what about Zabur? Do they accept all 150 psalms we have in our Bible, or they have different number of psalms? No, it, it, the only access they have to the Zabur, or the Gospel, or the Taurat, is what is in the Bible. They don't have an independent uh, Zabur other than what is in the Bible. No. And there's that recognition that these scriptures are included in the Christian scriptures or for the Torah or the Zabur within the Jewish scriptures. Yeah, there's a recognition of that. And that's one reason they have such a high respect for the Bible. But high respect is not to say that they read it necessarily. Yes. But remember, the Quran commands us, make your scriptures freely available, don't hide them, and uh, commands even the Prophet Muhammad, ask the Christians what their scriptures say. And so, uh, uh, that becomes an entree, oftentimes, for making the Bible available to Muslims. Okay, we'll come to conclusion now, and uh, five minutes later we will continue. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.